Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us at Getting the Most Out of Your Physical Security Assessment, a Client's Guide. Uh, I am Tim Roberts. I'm a and I'm Brent senior security, We're senior security consultants for NTT's uh, threat services team. Uh, so we do a variety of penetration assessments. Um, and today we're going to be primarily talking about some of the physical security assessments that, that Brent and I are in charge of. In addition to that, uh, we also have a blog. This is where we keep a lot of our talks if you're interested in seeing uh, us demonstrate some of these techniques that we kind of high level cover on this uh, at wehackpeople.com. And we also have uh, other sessions that we've recorded where we go more in depth on some of the social engineering tactics or physical bypass techniques as well. As always, you can see our Twitter contact information and we are more than, help, uh, more than happy to help or answer any questions that you might have. So feel free to reach out to us at any time. So uh, we have a few different options when we're talking about physical security assessments. Um, you know, and a lot of people in the industry will may do this a little bit differently, but uh, you know, Brent and I are in charge of the methodology for NTT. And so uh, two of the service offerings that we primarily focus on for physical uh, and specifically is that of overt. Uh, and then uh, we go into covert and then red team and we'll touch on those a little bit. But for the overt walkthrough, uh, this is an escorted walkthrough with the client where the penetration uh, tester would walk through uh, discussing different things. Uh, it's full disclosure. So it's kind of a Q&A as you're going around the facility um, as, as the client points out different things. Uh, you know, you as the client would say, hey, here's some of our high risk areas. And then the pen tester would look at that uh, and be able to kind of, you know, give you an idea of some vulnerabilities there. Uh, take a look at the locks, um, you know, your access controls and stuff like that. Uh, in addition, uh, to discussing theory and your risk uh, during that, because there's really, I mean, there can be some demonstrations in that, but, uh, you know, the whole point is to kind of just, it, it's, uh, again, a discussion. Um, but also looking at incident response, uh, discussing how that would handle. So if somebody were to, uh, you know, get into your facility, compromise anything like that, and an employee sees that, how would they escalate? So, um, yeah, that's just one of, one of the, uh, the things that we look at, we can also look at other policies and procedures too that are relevant to physical security standards uh, across your, your security. So another assessment type that we, uh, that Tim and I like to really focus on a whole lot are the, uh, the covert physical assessments. This is, uh, you know, you can hear it referred to as physical intrusion. Um, you know, of course we, we do have the full permission to do these types of assessments. We're not just gonna pick a place and, and show up and break in. Um, we enjoy our freedoms and don't wanna to go to jail. So everything that we talk about today, we, uh, you know, everything has gone through legal. We have all of the correct permissions and, and notes and everything required to do this. So in saying that, uh, with the covert part, this is, this is our, our attack where we, we, assimilate, we simulate real world attacks uh, what can we do without being caught? Where can we go without being noticed? And this is also where we will uh, secretly bypass things. And uh, at the end, we will say, here's what we were able to do, and here's how we did it, here's how to fix it. So I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the other things that we do, physical security assessments, uh, in conjunction with is the red team. So red team uh, assessments, this is kind of subjective. Um, and you know, many of you that may do offensive type security uh, may, may laugh at that because it is. It's kind of a, a term that's really kind of defined on um, you know, how you and your team do, do things. There's a general idea though. Uh, so this is a multi uh, tag vector kind of assessment. Uh, and then this is where we would do, like Brent was talking about, covert physical uh, intrusion. We would tie that in with uh, some social engineering and network penetration testing. So it's kind of uh, several tag vectors um, done during a, a period of time. Uh, this also covers drop boxes, uh, rogue access points, phishing, vishing, et cetera. Uh, if you look on the right here, you know, this is just a, I think this is a land turtle from a, from a while back uh, that uh, Brent had um, compromised the facility and was able to plug this in. And we were able to access it uh, remotely uh, and then get access to the system uh, and then to the network uh, itself. Uh, so, yeah, we, uh, we include a lot of different things for red teaming. So sort of a, uh, something to look for, whether you are uh, blue team or a pro tip for red team, 
if you can see the sticker that I put on there, it's gaffer tape, and I wrote, do not remove. I want it to look like it's official. It's supposed to be there. That way, if an employee or someone stumbles upon it, they aren't sure what it is. It provides, uh, you know, like, hey, this, this looks legitimate. I'm not going to worry about it. So um, I will put this on uh, devices that, that we plug in and leave, such as key loggers and other attack tools. And it's, it's been pretty successful so far. So something to look for, or again, if you're a red teamer, it's a tip on something that could help you out. So, so the whole purpose of this talk is, you know, we talk, a lot of clients that we speak with, they can be a bit overwhelmed with what is, what is this? Like, what is a red team? What do I need? Uh, physical security is important, but I'm not sure where to start. So, uh, the biggest thing that we want to address here is once we sort of educate on the different assessment types that are offered, what makes sense for you? So what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, what are your options? And oftentimes consulting groups will use, um, you know, like I said, different uh, definitions for like red teaming. Um, so it can differ. Uh, I think it's always important as a client to ask for a uh, methodology. I think it's important as a tester to have a methodology available. Um, this doesn't have to be granular, granular at all. In fact, you shouldn't expect it to be. Um, but it should be a high-level overview of, of some of the steps that are taken, uh, kind of how, how you go about doing these types of assessments. Um, you know, and also I think it's important if, if you're a salesperson. Uh, if you're doing any types of sales, um, you know, when you're, when you're pitching this to a client or you're reviewing the service offerings, that you – yourself understand, um, you know, these, some, at least a, a basic understanding of, of the approach. Uh, and if you, if you're, if you don't, uh, I think it's always important to include a pen tester. So maybe get one of the technical guys that actually performs the assessments that uh, the client's interested in uh, just to kind of be on the call. Uh, you know, even when you're doing kind of a, a pre-sales kind of thing, uh, I think it's important to do that just to get a clear understanding of, of what the client is expecting and then, you know, what we can provide to them as uh, people that offer those types of services. So, you know, what are the risks? Uh, what attack vectors are you most, you know, susceptible to? What's beneficial to check? So, for example, you know, power plants have to deal with domestic terrorism threats. They have different ID requirements. Uh, they also have physical, certain physical barrier requirements they have to deal with. And those are things that a standard corporate environment might not necessarily have to consider. So, yeah, looking at what attack vectors are most uh, applicable and beneficial to you, you know, um, it really kind of depends on those industries, like what, what Brent was saying, you know, what, what are you considering? Uh, if we're looking at banks versus retail, for example, um, the banks, obviously, you're going to be looking at something different than retail. Um, Retail security, I, I used to do some, some of that, uh, I think in my early 20s, um, but looking at like loss prevention, and you see a lot of different types of theft, uh, and, but even theft on the system and gift cards. Um, you know, I think it's important that you, you look at, well, if someone were to gain access to this system, uh, what would they be able to do? If they were to get access to this area, what would they be able to do? If you were to be able to walk into a bank uh, as a pen tester and plug in a key logger in one of the teller systems because you're doing some, I don't know, network tests for corporate. You know, those kinds of things happen a lot. Uh, in fact, our buddy Jason Street does, does a lot with banks. Um, but I think it's just important um, to, to evaluate your risk for your industry um, as, as well as, of course, your, your own facilities. And, and something else, you know, uh, if you look at the physical security side of things, you know, with banks versus retail, with banks, they house a lot of money. Retail, they usually have limited amounts in a safe, but banks, that's where the money stays. So, you know, they're going to put a, a bit more focus, a bank will put more focus on securing its vault, whereas retail might put more focus on uh, securing high dollar items from being taken out of the door. So, you know, something else to consider, too, are building locations. Uh, so, Tim and I have done physical assessments in various environments. I know uh, one time a few years ago, 
we were doing an assessment at a place where they said, hey, you know, be careful. There was a uh, an ATM vestibule that was in the same parking lot as the target uh, target location, and a few days before we arrived, someone was shot at this place. So obviously, it wasn't the greatest part of town. And so, you know, as as pen testers, those are things we have to consider too. But as clients, you know, are you in uh, an area where theft is high? Are you close to residential areas where it could increase your your chances for you know theft as well? Uh, some facilities are out away from the majority of things, or maybe they are in a dedicated uh, dedicated area for you know a corporate park. So those are things that you really have to consider: is what's around you, what what are the risks with that as well. You know, something interesting about uh, the story that Brent was talking about at that particular location: the area where the ATM was, uh, there was a PTZ camera. Uh, attached to the back, I think it was the back or the side of, of the uh, target facility that we were assessing. Uh, and that camera could have caught the incident. However, um, the dome on it was so weather-worn and scratched up, uh, it, was, it was pretty pointless to even have that camera there. So these are things that, you know, I think commonly people will overlook or, uh, you know, not kind of maintain. So these, that's just a small example of something that we, uh, we definitely had to point out. Um, but moving on here, system, data center, and generators, uh, are there critical power supplies accessible? Like if we drive by a building, one of the things that we look for, if we don't know where the data center is and there's multiple buildings on a campus uh, or a venue that we're assessing, then we will look where the generators are, where are the big power generators on the side? You know, um, that's usually a good indicator <laughs> that they're they're pushing some some uh, a lot of you know some some data in there right um, so looking at that are those accessible what if somebody were to gain access and I don't know blow it up or something like that you, you, you know it'll, 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 do you have a backup power supply um, if they were to take these out uh, you know would you <laughs> do you have a pretty good business continuity plan um, but looking at that if, if there's no fence there's no uh, any kind of barrier or anything like that to prevent the average person from just going in there. Uh, it's it's important to, to consider this. Um, and what kind of data is stored in your data center? So if, um, if someone were to gain access to your data center and they plug into the core switch or something, you know, what would they have access to exactly? Um, you know, and if you have a shared facility, so this is something that, that Brent and I see a lot of too, is there'll be a shared data center oftentimes. Are those segmented? You know, could some other client, uh, their their guy, get into to your data? Um, you know, accidentally take a server that he shouldn't, right? <laughs> That's unencrypted. So these are things to consider. Um, you know, Brent and I see a lot of laptops that are they can be docked or undocked, but they're not tethered uh, and they're left around um, open offices. Uh, we've we've walked in and uh, you know, one of the CISO office, his uh, his laptop is sitting there on the on the table. Uh, I remember walking in and I was pretending to be with IT and that I was doing some uh, whole disk encryption. We were updating our, our whole disk encryption. Um, <laughs> it was off the top of my head. That's that's what I went with. Uh, went up to the, uh, I think, I can't, I can't remember. She was like the receptionist or she did payroll or something. But she had access to the CISO's office. I walked up to her and I, I convinced her, you know, hey, I need to do this. And she's like, well, he's in a he's in a meeting right now. And I was like, well, it's okay. He doesn't even need to be in there. Just, you know, it's going to take just a second. And I had looked in there previously, and he had his laptop uh, just sitting there. It wasn't docked or anything. Um, and convinced her to let me in into his office. I gained access to his laptop. I uh, was able to get into it. And you know, even but if I didn't, let's say I walked out. Does the laptop indeed have whole disk encryption on it? Uh, what are the risks there if someone loses a laptop or lo leaves it in a coffee shop somewhere? Um, these are things to, that I think are super important to always consider, especially with the convenience of mobility and then people working from home and such. Yeah, so even going on to that, you know, one of the things that we will uh, look into is, you know, insider threats. So, You've got, obviously, you have employees. You also have third-party vendors. They need access to certain things, cleaning crews, maintenance, uh, you know, 
people working on printers. There's all sorts of reasons for third parties and employees to have access to certain things. Now, there are, uh, there are ways, obviously, to control that access where only certain people have certain master keys or uh, you know, certain access to specific areas, and that's great. But what, what happens if someone that has that access is a threat? Let's say they are going in and stealing proprietary information, or they are starting to slowly weaken the building over time, weaken the building's access controls over time, so that they can go in and, and do something malicious to something they shouldn't have access to. Do you have anything in place that can detect that? Do you have any sort of response to that? Um, we've been talking about key control. If an employee is let go, or if an employee quits and they still have their keys, do you just say, oh, well, uh, let's cross our fingers and hope for the best, knowing that a key that works is still out there, or do you, do you change things? So you've got to consider these sort of, of things for your environment. Um, you can't just, unfortunately, you can't just assume, well, they're gone, they won't be a problem anymore, because you, you don't know that. There could be some, uh, some motives there that you are unaware of, uh, some sort of you know, issues that they might have with the company and they want revenge or whatever the motivation might be. You can't assume that just because they quit or they were fired that they are out of the picture. So you have to go ahead and, and control that and make sure that, that the access is cut off when it needs to be. So, again, we're talking about threats. And so one of the things we like to ask clients, what keeps you up at night? That question is a, a pretty quick way to get, to quickly get to the source of concern, like the main area of concern. So we've already talked about potential, you know, terroristic threats. Uh, you know, Tim mentioned if we see a generator to a data center, if it's some sort of espionage or something, then... Uh, we just want to disrupt or whatever, then there's how easy would it be for terrorists to destroy part of a building, uh, something that's very important, like a, a generator. Um, as I just mentioned, insider threats. Um, they already have access they need. So if you're in a, an area or if you're in a certain industry or military, then you've got corporate espionage and trade secret, secrets to deal with. Do you have any sort of, of way to deter, like, determine if that's happening inside of your environment or not? You know, and then, of course, outsider threats, uh, you know, looking at, at, at these, uh, you know, outside of just criminals trying to get into your facility or anything like that. You know, Brent said destruction or disruption of data. Uh, you know, say somebody goes in, I don't know, say it's a... Uh, say it's a kid, right? They walk in and they just pull the fire alarm. <laughs> you know, um, th there's there's a lot of different things like that that can happen, uh, and I think it's it's just important to look at um, to look at the different types of outsider threats. Don't don't limit it to just oh yeah, some criminal off the street or some you know corporate espionage where somebody's trying to get in and steal your trade secrets. Um, natural disasters. You know, I mentioned earlier uh, business continuity. Do you have uh, disaster recovery plans in place? Do you do tabletop exercises? Uh, I think there's a lot of, I know there's a lot of assessment types out there um, and frameworks like to be accredited uh, or CNA accreditation and things that they require these. Um, you know, there's a lot of standards uh, that auditors, they, they ask to see your business continuity plan. But if, even if that's not the case, I think it's important that you have that, um, at least some kind of backup plan or if, if data is, uh, is disrupted, uh, if there is some kind of destruction or loss of data, if there's a big storm or something like that, um, that you're able to back that up. Or say a virus gets loose and, uh, you know, do you have your backups and, and say it's des destroying things, right? It's really messing up your systems or, you know, some, it's connected to some node overseas. You know, it's, I think it's important to, to have um, these walkthroughs with the teams that are in charge of, of different things like that, your networking team and such. So physical side assessments, again, uh, this is the overt walkthrough. We sort of touched on this earlier, but the, the good thing about this, uh, and, and this is something that we usually recommend after 
a covert assessment where we sneak around. Uh, when, once we're finished sneaking around, then, you know, we can go do a walkthrough with you. Sometimes if the risk is too great, let's say if there are armed guards or, um, you know, if there's a lot of political issues within the company and they don't want anyone to feel slighted, then uh, one of the better options is for an overt walkthrough. There, there are no surprises. You know, we are with uh, facilities. We're with, you know, the managers or whoever needs to be involved. And we basically go through, we, we walk through the entire facilities. We look at the exterior. We look at the perimeter. Uh, you know, we look at things such as cameras. So Tim mentioned the weather dome on the security camera earlier that could have caught a crime, but unfortunately it's weathered. Those are things you want an assessor to look at. You want to look at, uh, to, at camera placement. So if you have a camera focusing on the front door, but you have a side door with nothing there, then where is an attacker going to go? They're going to follow the path of least resistance. You also need to look at lighting. Uh, you know, are your parking lots or your entrances, are they properly lighted? Uh, you've got to look at physical barriers. If you are in a place where a car could potentially just drive through the front door, that's not good. You need someone that knows, hey, you guys need to put some sort of a physical barrier here to prevent a car from ramming your building. Um, this really gives us a chance to focus on areas without, you know, the, the stress of, of being caught. So uh, we can go through and evaluate your physical access controls even more in depth. So we can look at, you know, your alarm placement. If uh, your your badge readers, do they have any sort of tamper switch on them where if an attacker is trying to remove that that badge reader to place an implant, is there any sort of, of tamper switch that will create an alarm condition? Um, you know, uh, door configuration, we look at uh, is it easy for us to bypass? Can we do simple latch slipping attacks and just open a door without any, any sort of keys or credentials? Um, so these are all things that we that we can really really focus on through the overt part of the walkthrough. You know, and then looking at it, even so, your request for exit sensors too. Um, you know, are your placement of your request for exit sensors are they too close to the door? So one of the things that Brent and I often do to get access or bypass some two-factor authentication, like let's say there's a retinal scanner and the badge, right? Um, we're not able to, to bypass the retinal, for example, or it's going to take too long. Um, if we, if there's a request for access to a sensor that is uh, improperly placed um, and configured, then we can get it some canned air. Say we picked up some canned air in the office supply area next to the printers. Uh, you know, turn that thing upside down, stick it under the door, uh, and the bitterments from it will rise and it will trip that request for exit sensor because oftentimes it is temperature and motion fluctuation. Um, and so any kind of variation with that, it's, uh, it's, it's going to trip the, the sensor because of the density of, of the bitterments and because of the temperature. Uh, if, if you've ever turned some canned air upside down, I don't recommend doing it in your hand, <laughs> get a chemical burn, but, uh, it's, uh, but that works pretty well. Um, you know, uh, pins and hinges, Brandon mentioned the doors, right? Um, uh, we have, there, there's some tools out there that will quickly let you, uh, smack those pins out, uh, and take the door off. So let's say it's an after hours assessment or it's an area that there's not a lot of population or a lot of, uh, a lot of congestion of traffic, uh, foot traffic, uh, or let's say, I don't know, uh, say you're pretending to be with maintenance or can, you know, you're part of the construction crew or something. Uh, you're installing some new badge reader, uh, able to just take that door off uh, and just completely bypass it all together. Uh, it's funny here, this picture uh, was taken. Uh, I don't know if you guys can notice, but there's enough slack there to just go ahead and pull that out of the power. <laughs> it's the camera. And this is an old camera, but it was actually still in use. Uh, and I think Brent actually took this picture, but you can see it hung, uh, hung up and it's plugged into the wall right beside it. And then, you know, tons of slack there. That's ridiculous. That's just, uh, that's <laughs> one example of several ridiculous things we see. Yeah, we see some pretty interesting things. You know, you in, out of convenience, you might have someone that does a quick fix, like, hey, uh, install this camera. And so they 
in this instance, you can see it, uh, the dangling cable, that is the power cable. And you can see, as Tim mentioned, it's plugged in to the outlet right there. Uh, to the left and right of that are windows that do open. So it would be pretty easy if someone needed to just to go unplug that. So, um, you know, and that's that's something else too. When when you are having these access controls or these uh, these security options installed, make sure that it's being done by someone who's properly trained. Oftentimes, we will see maintenance. They will install. They will install. Let's say a really nice dimple lock on a door. Uh, dimple locks are, are pretty secure. It takes longer to pick them. However, they won't set the uh, the security hinge correctly in the door strike, and so it leaves it susceptible to basic latch bypassing or latch slipping. Um, so now you've got a very expensive lock that is useless because it wasn't installed properly. Um, again, here with this camera, it could have been installed properly, and it would have been fine placement. Uh, so you need to make sure that that whoever is installing these things, that they are up to par on their training and they know what they are doing. You know, something interesting too about those cameras, uh, we see this oftentimes when we get on the network, right? Uh, we'll do a scan and we'll see that the security system or the security cameras uh, are IP based or, and they're, they've got default credentials from the vendor or the manufacturer of them. So again, as Brent mentioned, make sure that even when you're installing, uh, cameras on your network that um, you're you have some minimum baseline configurations and you're kind of going through and and not just leaving it at default don't just plug and play and walk away with something like that because if somebody turns off all your cameras uh, then you have no evidence of, of something happening sometimes um, or especially if it's an insider threat right um, I remember uh, I used to work doing some some state work and I remember that there, there was a uh, it was an employee, uh, I think it was in networking or something like that, ended up still on a bunch of servers, um, but he turned off the camera system, uh, walked in, grabbed the servers, walked back, or was stuck them in the back of his truck, um, walked back in, turned the cameras back on, and nobody knew who did it. The only reason why uh, people found out who did it is that they found uh, these servers on, I think it was on eBay, <laughs> and so uh, the guy was trying to sell them. Um, so that's something to, to look at. You know, as we mentioned earlier with red teaming and uh, multi-attack vectors, uh, this is going to include the covert part. So um, this is where you want a real-world attack. So if something to mention, too, if you've never performed a, a vulnerability scan or even a basic penetration test against your internal network or your external, uh, your external assets, Starting off with a red team, a full-blown red team, is not ideal. A full-blown red team is for more mature environments that have gone through other assessment types. They've had a chance to, to uh, remediate issues, and they are, they're, they're more mature than some network that's never had a pen test. If you've never had a pen test and you start off with a full-blown red team, it's going to be a mess. You're going to uh, be very overwhelmed with the issues that need to be fixed, and uh, it, it's going to take a lot to remediate those. So uh, a red team is for more mature environments, but that's always a goal that you want to work up to. Okay, we've been doing this for a bit. We're ready for a red team. So, um, you know, and, and a red team, we've, we've heard people uh, explain this in different ways. We'll say, I want a red team. Uh, I want a red team assessment for my external uh, assets and our web apps. And then we'll say, okay, well, what about internal and physical? And they'll say, no, just, just web apps and external. Well, that's not a red team. That, that's just testing against your external and web apps. Uh, the red team part is where you get a, a team of people that are attacking your company through many different avenues to gain access to accomplish a main goal. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you it, it takes a, I don't, real quick, I don't know if you you noticed the, the image here, but it's from a movie called Sneakers. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually a, a fun movie to watch uh, with some, some guys that do um, penetration testing. And 
and them sneaking in here, uh, both of them working together to, to distract the receptionist. Um, but, you know, a red team does, as Brent said, a red team also takes a place over a longer period of time. So when we do these covert or overt walkthroughs, um, we're usually just given about a week, sometimes two weeks if we're lucky. Um, but oftentimes it's just a week to do the assessment. Uh, whereas a red team, of course, there's several different elements to that, as Brent mentioned. Um, and so that that uh, takes place over a longer period of time and usually through a little bit more, um, uh, I guess, covert methods of, of technical entry for like your network and such. Um, covert physical security assessment. You know, uh, we've, we've said this a lot. We keep, we keep saying covert, overt. Um, but it is essentially it's physical intrusion. It's simulating um, real world attacks. So if, if a criminal wanted to try to get in here, how would they do it? What kind of tools do they commonly use? Uh, what kind of tools can be made? Um, you know, there are some custom tools that Brent and I have made. There's some custom tools that some friends of ours have made um, that we utilize when we do these types of assessments. Um, but there's an emphasis on that, right? An emphasis on not only the tools that they use, but the techniques. And this includes social engineering. So being able to get into a facility doesn't always mean that you need to have some uh, expensive gadget to, or, you know, clone a badge or slip a lock. Sometimes this means just walking behind somebody and going through the motions, um, you know, playing a, uh, the sound of, of the badge uh, reader from your phone or something. If, 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 they're be, if the person in front of you is being extra cautious, but it's always important too that your employees are aware of this as they don't just hold the door open for someone because I think it's uh, human nature for us to open these doors for people uh, or hold them open, especially if their hands are full or something. And oftentimes we miss whether or not they badged in. Uh, so it doesn't have to, you don't have to be, you know, super James Bondy about it. Uh, all you have to do is just pretend to be there, that, that you weren't, you're supposed to be there, and then go through the motions of badging in, walking behind somebody, and if they, they and just start talking if you want to. If they start looking at you, just talk to them, say, hey, how are you doing? Or be on your phone, you know, walk with intent and with purpose. Um, you know, social engineering is a huge part of uh, the covert stuff. It's not just lock picking and bypassing your, uh, your access controls. Um, but attempting to do that is important, and that's uh, something that we, we often do. Um, sometimes we'll even test different methods. So let's say we gain the entry to the facility and we get, you know, the target. We'll have the client maybe mark a mark a server, uh, you know, in the data center or a laptop that says "Take me" or it's, it has you know NTT on it, right? Um, we've had clients do that where they don't want us accessing the system or the network itself, but they'll uh, mark these kind of loot that that Brent and I will attempt to to get access to. So say we do that and we walk out with it. We'll also try to go back in using an alternative method. So let's say we tailgate it. Okay, well now let's try uh, doing it by cloning a badge. If we've got time, we'll do that. Um, so it's always important to to make. Sh I, I think I think that's what's beautiful about covert physical security uh, assessments is that there's a lot of creativity to it. Um, there's a lot of dynamic um, ways, whereas the overt is it's pretty static, right? Yeah, and so you know, Tim mentioned with uh, with the clients that will designate trophies for us to uh, locate and remove. You know, we that the big thing about that is testing security awareness and of, of the employees. So, uh, one recent example is we gained access to a client, and one of the things that we were able to remove was a very expensive juicer from one of the break rooms. Uh, the break room was in heavy use. Tim and I waited for a while for people to clear out, but they weren't. So I just walked up right in front of them and unplugged the juicer and made some small talk and walked away. As I was walking down the stairs, I was approached by a couple employees who said, jokingly, uh, you're not stealing our mixer, are you? And so I just shrugged my shoulders and I said, well, of all things to steal, a mixer would be good. And uh, they laughed. And then I then said, I'm going to set this here on the floor. I've got a few more things uh, up there I need to go grab. And they said, okay, sounds good. So, uh, you know, that was a good way to sort of test that, that security awareness. Uh, the culture of that company was not one where they were really concerned about 
items being removed. Uh, again, it was a juicer, obviously not a lot of threat there uh, as far as the network or anything goes, but that was just one of many items that we were taking in an attempt to draw attention, hoping someone would say, hey, what are you doing? Are you supposed to be here? You know, that reminds me, Brent, uh, we had done another assessment uh, similar to that, and we and, uh, we had taken, I think it was a, it was a PC and a monitor, like a workstation. <laughs> we, were, we were wheeling it out. We found a, a cart. We wheeled it out into the elevator, wheeled it out into the lobby. There were like four security guards. And these are armed security guards, too. And we're like, hey, you know, is it cool if we leave this here real quick because we got to pull the truck around? And uh, they're like, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if we're, we're supposed to keep keep eye on that stuff. And we're like, uh, well, is there anywhere we can maybe like just stash it out of the way? That way nobody walks off with it. And we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, just <laughs> stash it over there. Points off to the corner in this little cubby or this nook <laughs> in the lobby. And we ended up stashing it there. And security guards, you know, didn't care at all. So that's something else important, and, and Brent and I often harp on is, uh, you, you know, making sure that your security guards are indeed, uh, you know, doing their job. Hey, we we have a talk that we did. Um, it's called Security Guards, LOL. And the, the whole point of that is not to make fun of security guards by any means. The whole focus of that talk is to point out the issues where you have these large facilities and basically – the, the bulk of their physical security program rests on the shoulders of one, maybe two security guards. Um, so we, you know, we have several examples of, of real, real war stories, if you will, uh, from different assessments we've performed where we point out some of these super ridiculous things that we were able to not only get away with, but have the security guards assist us with as well. You know, and, and, looking at intrusion detection systems and alarms and stuff, you know, outside of the security guards, do you have uh, uh, something in place? Let's say, I don't know, let's say your data center doesn't have floor to ceiling walls. Um, do you have an intrusion detection uh, system above the ceiling? You know, say somebody's trying to cl climb over it. Um, you know, there's been cases where vending machines have been right up against the wall and that's adjacent to the data center. And I've been able to climb up on that vending machine and hop over. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's important to note if someone were to do that, there's a sensor up there. Uh, do, you, do you have you know, some kind of compensating controls up there, like a fan or things like that? Um, but your intrusion detection, if an alarm does go off, who does that go to? Does it go to the security guard up front that, from one person, right? Uh, does it go to a, a distribution list? You know, being able to test these access control monitoring too. Um, you know, there's devices out there uh, like Pro Proxmark, um, things like that, that you can brute force uh, badge readers. You know, yeah, if you see several uh, swipes, right, uh, in conjunction with one another, is that alerting? Uh, if the same badge is bat uh, scanned several times or in two different locations, let's say you've got um, – I don't know, let's say you got a campus in New York and one in, I don't know, Kentucky. If somebody is using the same badge, the same location, or, or at those locations on the same day, you know, do you have uh, something that alerts to that, right? Um, these are things that I don't think a lot of people consider uh, because when Brent and I uh, and several people in this industry uh, scan a badge or, you know, clone a badge, um, we bump into somebody we're able to get their badge, read it with like a boss cloner or something, and we're able to replicate that, and we're using it. And that badge is being used by that person that same day, as well as, you know, the pen tester uh, that same day. Uh, are you able to, to look at that? Uh, this was actually a good uh, thing that happened at one of our clients uh, where we had scanned into a data center that is in the same city, but it's a uh, different, it's, I don't know, it's several miles away. Um, but we had cloned a badge from a guy during, uh, during his smoke break, and we were able to use leave. We didn't even go to the facility that he went into. We went straight to where the data center was, uh, the other facility, and we scanned in, got in, uh, and we did that. We were in there for a while, however, before anybody noticed. The security guard had noticed that uh, the, his badge was being used at two different locations. Uh, so that was you know, a, a good compliment on them. Uh, but how is that being escalated too? Was you know we mentioned security guards, but employees, uh, if they do see something suspicious, 
uh, a lot of times they won't approach because they're afraid of confrontation or they don't want to call somebody out and be wrong and are embarrassed. Um, and if they don't, they don't do that and they see something suspicious, what are they doing? Are they just going maybe telling the other person that the, uh, they work with? Are they escalating it to uh, a supervisor or somebody that will go over and say, hey, you know, can I help you? You don't have to be confrontational. You don't have to be a jerk about it, right? And we tell this to people when we're doing security awareness training. You don't have to be uh, mean about it. Uh, you know, suspicious does not mean mean. It just means you go over politely and say, hey, can I help you? Um, hey, are you looking for somebody? And take a look at their badge. Uh, is their badge flipped over? Uh, is it just the white spot? Because sometimes we won't know what the badge looks like at a target facility that we're assessing. And we'll just flip the badge over and use the blank space and then walk around and nobody will ask anything. So uh, incident response monitoring services, you know, we have, uh, we have clients that they will, let's say they have uh, an outside security uh, company that monitors their internal cameras after hours. So it was able to gain access to this one facility. We knew everyone left around 5, 5.30. So about 5.30 we showed up. We had been walking around inside this place. We'd gotten in every single place we wanted to, and no one showed up. And so as we were leaving, we noticed the main camera focused on the front door. Uh, I'm literally waving at the camera, and then I start doing actual jumping jacks trying to be as ridiculous as possible, hoping someone would show up, and no one ever did. Uh, but prior to that assessment, the client swore that those cameras are being monitored. And so you just, you know, you want to check. You want to make sure that that's actually monitored because no one showed up for us. So, you know, in saying that, when you are uh, helping to scope out these assessments, don't pigeonhole testers. So if you... If you are having a covert assessment done or even uh, like social engineering, you know, phishing or something, and you tell the assessor you are not allowed to emulate an employee, you're not allowed to impersonate a vendor, you're not allowed to have uh, any of our logos on any of your things, it, all of these things that you're taking away are things that criminals use. So if you are removing things that criminals utilize, and limiting the testers, then you're only, you know, you're hurting yourself. You're, you're not going to have a, a very accurate assessment. Um, you know, and that goes to uh, with the after hours assessments. We'll get into that here in a minute. But um, this, or this picture I took uh, is from an assessment where, you know, we were allowed to, if we found keys or credentials, we were allowed to take those and use them. So, uh, and those are things that happen. Those are real world attacks. Uh, you know, and like Brent was saying, don't pigeonhole them, right? Uh, physical assessments are dynamic, uh, especially the covert ones. I mentioned that earlier, you know, getting too in depth, uh, you know, well, what kind of lock picks you guys use? Well, truthfully, we don't use our lock picks a whole lot because we're bypassing and we're slipping latches, uh, we're tailgating or something like that. Uh, you know, we will uh, oftentimes. Uh, if they were trying to get through a fire escape or, or something that, you know, but we're not going to take a hammer and bash a window, right? There are stuff that we take considerations we do. We don't even really use bump keys or anything like that because of the risk of scratching some of the pins uh, and, and et cetera. So. so as I mentioned, after hours versus business hours testing, uh, there, there are some good things about both. If you are, uh, you know, if you're, if you're somewhere where there are a lot of people, and you obviously want to be there during the day so you can, uh, you know, for the whole social engineering aspect, uh, cloning badges, tailgating, and so on. However, after hours, um, is there are risks. There are good things because you want to see, okay, what happens if, if someone gains access to this building after hours? Does anyone notice? How do they report? Uh, how do they respond? And, and you have, you really have to consider environment such you know banks and airports um, there's a lot more risk there even during daytime hours versus a typical corporate environment yeah we've had uh you know make sure security guards are they are they alert uh, or are they watching netflix i see that all the time especially late at night um you know we've had clients also tell us don't get shot this should never ever be a risk if you ever say that as a client slap yourself because that's 
that's not something that, that should ever be uh, even said, right? Uh, this is that's not something to joke about. Um, yeah, of course you don't want to get shot, but if that is a risk, if your security guards are that heightened and that itchy, uh, you know, and that's a that's a risk, and don't take it uh, as a tester. Don't take it. Um, you know, you always want to make sure that the person is. Uh, this this is supposed to be a simulation, not real world. Um, so uh, ensure that nobody gets hurt. So um, we talked about you know basic entry entry methods all throughout this. So I've talked about latch slipping. Uh, there's so many ways that we can get in where whether it's cloning credentials again or uh, just slipping a latch. And um, we have this uh, video here. This is me just popping a latch open very quick uh, with my favorite tool, which is a piece of plastic. It's basically an upgraded attack of the uh, uh, upgraded version of the credit card attack, if you will. Um, so, you know, we've talked about tailgating. The more people that there are, the easier it is to blend in. So understanding basic entry methods, uh, you know, electronic bypass tests, uh, you know, I know we only got a couple minutes here, so we won't talk about it too much, but here uh, is, we use a clipboard here and I've got a, a few different antennas and I've also got a product mark in there and an Arduino with a wireless uh, USB plugged into it. We use this just to kind of scan in. So if you want to go ahead and play that video. Also, I think it's important to note that, it, you know, it is harder to clone high frequency badges. So look at the kind of badges that you use. Um, you know, are you using RFID blocking sleeves to prevent somebody from, uh, from bumping into you and, and cloning a badge? I'm not sure if that video played or not. Uh, if it didn't, you guys can, uh, again, we'll have this uh, on our website, uh, wehackpeople.com. So uh, more things to consider. You know, we've had clients that will ask us, hey, can you record video and audio during this assessment? Uh, especially with social engineering, those are things that you need to check with you, your your law firm, with your lawyers before you ask these things, because a lot of these things are against state laws, uh, federal laws. So uh, when you're asking for certain things like that, of uh, recording people who are unaware they are being recorded, there's a lot behind that. So you really need to consider those laws. You know, I think the uh, infosec they focus a lot on. Uh on logical threats, but I think it's uh, it's really important to focus on, you know, where those logical systems are sitting in the facilities that, that house them. Don't just do this just for checkbox security. It's, that's a horrible way of conducting your security. Don't just do it because you have to meet the standards. Uh, you want a security culture. Yeah, and, uh, you know, if you've got, if your, secure, your environment is secure, your network's secure, everything's patched, you know, things are encrypted, um, but you have systems that someone, you know, a laptop, someone can just walk through the front door and grab a laptop, or someone can just walk through the back door and go into your data center. You've got a whole different set of issues there outside of, of vulnerability management and patch management with your logical network. So that's, that's pretty much it. I know that we covered quite a bit of information, uh, a lot of high level stuff, especially with the, uh, the covert entry methods, bypass methods, uh, you know, we are more than happy to answer questions you might have. Again, we have our, our Twitter handles as well as our work emails here on these slides. Um, and again, wehackpeople.com for a lot more in-depth information on uh, covert entry methods and, and some of our other war stories we didn't have time to get into today. Thank you, guys.